And I invite you to turn with the Bible to the book of Ezra. I'm really enjoying walking through the Old Testament and New Testament with several of you because I've never preached in the book of Ezra. And I just feel like my heart has been opened and fallen in love uh, with a new part of Scripture uh, by just the discipline of, of doing some more work on it and seeing how God was at work in the life of his people some 2,400 years ago. The same God who was at work then is at work now. And I'm so grateful. I want to invite any of you to take up the challenge over the next few weeks and read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, if that sounds difficult to do, it isn't. It's 23 chapters. You can read a couple chapters a day. You've got it in a couple of weeks. Even if you miss some days, you can get it in three weeks. Am I right? Uh, many of us are walking through a, a program of reading, and we invite you to come alongside us and do that. And I think some people don't want to jump in in the middle. They think, I'm going to wait till January and read through the whole Bible. But I want you to know that if you jump in right now in the month of June and you start with Ezra 1 tomorrow morning, which is where you'll be, if you do that, I just want you to know that you have missed a lot of genealogies in the Old Testament. And you've missed a lot of endless descriptions of the law and so forth. This is a great time to jump in. You're on the tail end of Old Testament history, and then you get into the poetic books and the prophets, and so please join us. Uh, we would love to uh, have you continue on with us. In fact, if you want, I'm going to encourage you to take one of these prayer cards and write your email address down and say, send me uh, Bible reading reminders. And if you just want to hand it to me or, or uh, find uh, another usher or pastor to give it to, we would love to get you signed up with a daily email uh, reminder of the reading program and, and what's going on. In today's reading, as we open up to the first chapter of Ezra, we're opening up to surprising news and to truly great news for the people of God. The people of God have been in the promised land for hundreds of years, as you read through the Old Testament, until suddenly God's had enough of their unfaithfulness. And as a result of their unfaithfulness, God boots them out of the promised land. The kingdom breaks in two between Israel and Judah. A foreign power, Assyria, comes along and takes the northern ten tribes into captivity. The Babylonian Empire, a different uh, power at that time, takes the Judean people, the southern kingdom where Jerusalem is, into captivity. And, and they've lost their land. It's a dark time as we open up to the history of where we are in Ezra. But this is great news because God is inviting them to come home. It's what these people have prayed for since they've been in captivity for 70 years. They've looked forward to God's deliverance, and it's finally here. But what may be so surprising about this is that the good news comes from an unexpected source comes from the king of the Persians. You think, wait a minute, Persian, not Babylonian or Assyrian. We'll talk about that in a minute, but the Persians ended up taking over the Babylonians and the Assyrians. The Persian king, Cyrus, issues a decree. I want to encourage you to, to think about uh, this good news coming from an unlikely source. And, and what is it that you're waiting for God to deliver you from? What is it that, that God needs to come through for you on? And could he do it in unexpected ways? Please stand with me as you're able. I'm reading from Ezra, chapter 1. And sure enough, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, how unlikely, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. Did you know that? Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in the any locality where survivors may now be living, the people 
are to provide them with silver and gold. So not only can they do it, but the Persian Empire is going to pay for it. With goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, there were 50,000 in all, we learned that later, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors insisted with, um, assisted them with the articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts in addition to free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed them in the temple of his God. Heavenly Father, would you take what has been stolen and would you restore what you long to restore in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I, I almost can't wait to get into Sunday school <laughs> because we're going to dive deeper into the history of some of this stuff. And it's just been so much fun to hear the questions that you have as we banter back and forth about some of this. Let, let, me, let me pause to give you a bit of a big picture of what's going on here. And the background of this book is so important. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about homecoming. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are about, are about the rebuilding of the temple that's been destroyed by the Babylonians. They're about the rebuilding of the community of people and their faith. With, and, and they're about the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem. Um, in fact, flip your sermon notes over. You see the Sunday school notes? Let, let's just fill a few of them in. Won't this be fun? This is like a head start. We've never tried this before, so I don't know if it works. But let's find out. These two books are about three main leaders. Zerubbabel in chapters 1 through 6. They're about Ezra in chapters 7 through 10. And they're about Nehemiah in Nehemiah 1 to 7. Zerubbabel is the leader that commissions the rebuilding of the temple. So that's what you read about first in Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah used to be one book, by the way. It's the other word. Ezra is in charge of rebuilding the people's faith and their commitment to Torah, their commitment to the law and the word of God, as well as the community of people and their worship. And Nehemiah rebuilds the walls of protection around Jerusalem. So all of these things that had been lost, all of these things that had been stolen are being reclaimed by God. Uh, so this is about God's intervention to bring his people home in a hopeless situation. I don't think this just has relevance a couple thousand years ago. Have you ever felt like you're an exile in this world? Have you ever felt like just, just by being a Christian and, and, and loving Jesus tenderly and caring about his values, does it ever make you feel like you're somehow 900 miles east <laughs> somewhere in the desert at a place in your life where, where maybe some or others are in a place in their life where they're suffering with the bondage of poor decisions. And that's certainly where Israel is at this moment. Or they're in loneliness or desolation. Maybe there's a circumstance in your life where you absolutely need a miracle for God to redeem what's been lost. I want you to see with me three encouraging lessons from Ezra this morning. And the first is this. It's hard to miss. God has the final say in this world. And I want to encourage you to start reading through Ezra this week. And as you do, I want you to read with this eye that God initiates all of these things. God has the final say in this world. If you're like me, or if I'm like you, you sometimes need this encouragement because you realize that as a Christian, this world is not your home. We sometimes feel like a, a foreigner or a stranger in, in a different land that, that reverences different things. And if your heart's tender to the sacred things of God, you care about the fact that the temple is laying there in ruins. For these people, they could do nothing about it. They were a conquered people. They, they were a people who didn't have the power in and of themselves to give themselves permission or resources to go back the 900 miles to rebuild that temple and to restore worship of God. It's not something that they could do. In so many ways, I think our experience of living in this world is the experience 
of exile. Solomon's temple, the house of God, has been destroyed. How unthinkable would that have been? That temple stood there for 700 years. And it was a glorious temple. If you've been reading through the Old Testament or are familiar with it, wow. Wow. The, the, number, the sheer number of years that it took, 20-some years to build it. it. It was a grand palace. They thought that would stand forever for God's glory. The glory of the Lord inhabited that temple, and now it's in rubble. And you actually read about that in, in Kings and Chronicles. But not only has the temple been torn down, but consider this. The sacred artifacts have been stolen from the temple. You remember all the, the gold plates and, and the... the, the the altar itself. Think about this. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586. How devastating that must have been them. You know, it's, it's one thing to lose an artifact that's 700 years old. It's another thing to lose an artifact that's a couple thousand years old that goes all the way back to the time of Moses. The Ark of the Covenant was inside of the Holy of Holies. This is where their hearts are. And they have their hearts absolutely ripped out from under them. In addition, as a way of keeping God's people down, all the Israelite leaders, so their educated people, their teachers, and their artists, are the first ones that the Babylonians and the Assyrians in the north strategically remove from the land. So that so that they can't possibly be organized enough to form some kind of intelligent rebellion. The glory of Israel has been lost. And as you open the pages of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, I want us to know that, that we're seeing light in the midst of an incredible darkness. It's sometimes hard to remember in our darkness that God is still the ultimate ruler on the throne. But I see an incredible glimpse of that right there in Ezra 1 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, well, there it is. The Babylonians and the Assyrians, they conquer, they take them into exile, they destroy their sacred things. In fact, as a mockery, uh, later on, they would put pigs in the temple. They make a mockery of the sacred things. In, and, and God speaks to the king of Persia. Do you see it? In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, there's more evidence of God's control, not the Assyrians' control or the Persians' control, any of their control. The Lord moved the heart of King Cyrus of Persia to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it into writing. And this is what the king of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Does this inspire you to pray for our earthly leaders? This is really hopeful stuff, is it not? <laughs> These persons aren't nice people either. But somehow, God gets Cyrus's attention. So what happens is, the, the superpower of the Persians come in, and they wipe out both of them. And they say, they can go back to their temple, because God told me to send them back to their temple. So all three of these leaders, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Jeremiah, are each going to have edicts from the kings. King Cyrus, then King Artaxerxes, and King Artaxerxes. And, and they're going to, in succession, be commissioned by the king of Persia to go do God's will. I love that. I don't want us to miss that. Not all is lost in a lost and dark world. God is still in control in ways that we would never guess are remotely possible. How could God stir the king of Persia, modern-day Iran, we expect God to work through names like Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. They're Old Testament heroes of faith. But God nudges the heart of Cyrus. God has sovereignty over the superpowers in this world. Can I invite you to do something? Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Some of you have been languishing in the Old Testament so long, you're wondering when we get to the New Testament. There it is. Matthew chapter 1. I want to show you something here in just a second. When you're in the experience of exile, and you know you're not home, and it seems like the sacred things of life are being stomped on, and you don't understand what God is up to, we may be tempted to wonder, where is God in all of this mess? And I think Matthew 1 actually answers that question really succinctly. 
God is on the throne. You know where I'm going, right? You've heard my Christmas sermon on Matthew 1 before, right? Matthew chapter 1, I love this. Matthew chapter 1, the first page of the New Testament, is a summary of the Old Testament by giving a genealogy. See, you don't get out of genealogies just by going to the New Testament. There they are again. <laughs> but it's an important, incredible record. If your Bible's laid out like mine is, and I know mine is, you notice that it's, it's presented visually in three sections. Do you see it? Say yes. Okay, you see it. There it is, in three even sections. So it starts with Abraham, the next section starts with David, and then it says after the what? You're learning your Old Testament history. These are three major sections of Old Testament history. Oh, and by the way, Zerubbabel, he's not only mentioned in Ezra, but there he is, right there. Do you see him? Say yes. Do you, <laughs> verse 13, okay. Verse 17 is really important. Matthew is showing you something. He says, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. Isn't that cool? 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, a major event in their history. And 14 from the exile to Christ. Is that cool or what? The last name on this genealogy is who? It's Jesus. It's right there in verse 16. What this tells me is that God will have the last word in all of human history. Jesus is the last name there because that's, that's everywhere that the Old Testament is going. Now, that, now you know that Zerubbabel is not only working on building the physical temple, but Zerubbabel is part of this line, the genealogy, the lineage to Jesus Christ. Not only is Zerubbabel working on something with his faithfulness, but God is working on something through Zerubbabel that he could never understand. God is bringing about his ultimate purposes in this world. Jesus Christ is, is the last name on this list because it's the only name that's needed. God has the last word. And I think that exiles in foreign lands, in dark places, who watch things being destroyed that they care so deeply for, who weep so bitterly in the darkness, need to always remember, God has the final say. The other thing is, as, as you look through Matthew, you notice that there are so many names on this that you wouldn't expect. Um, verse 3, Judah was the father of Perez and, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, now, I won't give you too much of that Christmas sermon. I've got to save it for Christmas. But whose mother was Tamar, you remember, that's scandalous, isn't it? You remember that horrible story of incest and prostitution? It's, it's all there. The, and, the, and there's more. Solomon is there. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. It doesn't name her by name, but you know who that is. That's Bathsheba. Was, was that Israel's best moment? No, not really. It's not only true that God's enemies can't stop God's plan. It's true that God's own people can't stop God's own plans. That in our unfaithfulness, we still don't have the last say. God is still on the throne. The Old Testament is all about that. It, it's all about painting this picture of God's incredible work in the midst of people's incredible flakiness. It actually lists the reasons for the exile, if you want to know what they are. They're twofold. The exile is the result of two things. It's the result of idolatry and injustice. <laughs> idolatry and injustice. And you can read all, read all about that actually in 2 Kings chapter 17. And what that does tell me is this too. That tells me that there's still a high price to be paid for our sin. Isn't there? I mean, somehow God still allows us to live with the unnecessary pain and the unnecessary rubble and the unnecessary consequences. Because the way 2 Kings 17 reads, the exile was not absolutely necessary. In order for God to bring Jesus Christ into this world to fulfill his promise that he gave all the way back to Abraham through David, 
It wasn't absolutely necessary, but it was a detour that God's people needed to have because of their own choices. And I think that's an important lesson in our lives as well. Our choices really matter. It's not that we have the power to override God's permanent plans and we need to rest in that security. And at the same time, I think God weeps over the needless pain that we bear when, when we don't invest our lives following him. Recently had a conversation with a 21-year-old who asked me, well, what do you think of people who live like the devil all their life? This wasn't their words. And then on their deathbed, they receive Jesus. What do you think of that? And we would call those 11th hour conversions, right? And I said, praise God, because Jesus sacrifice for them on the cross is sufficient. And, and they'll be in heaven just like you and I will be in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that, that it's so big that, that there isn't any kind of measurement that says I'm more important or more special in heaven than you are. I'm so thankful. I think the first thing that I'll do when I get to heaven is I'll just fall on my face and say thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. nothing remarkable about investing what we do for him compared to what he did for us. God, speak to those who are in Babylon. Speak to those whose hearts have wandered where sacred things have been broken. It's not too late for your spirit to reach them. In your mercy, when I think what God grieves over is the unnecessary pain. It's not that his grace was ever in question, that he couldn't save them, that he was nervous that somehow if they waited that long, they wouldn't be saved. They will be saved. But it's the matter of the needless striving and pain. At least from my experience, living a life fully committed to Christ is the best life that there is. not just someday, somewhere out there, when we cross into eternity, but here and now. Jesus came to bring his kingdom here and now. We don't have to live in Babylon. We can enjoy the presence of God. And, and I know to Cyrus's language, the God who lives in Jerusalem. <laughs> this is an understanding God will change. God is in control. Do you believe it? Second thing I see here that I think is so important is that God brings new life from loss. I don't think that losses are always necessary. And the way I read the Old Testament, you know, their delay of 40 years in the desert, their bondage, all these other things, they're all interpreted by the Old Testament itself as consequence for their sin. So, so you read it that way. And, and you'll find it. And exile is certainly one of those things. Exile is one of those prodigal timeouts, if you will. You can read about other ones in the Bible too, right? Jesus told the uh, teaching story, the parable of the, the lost son. And the lost son ends up being a servant, and, and he ends up slopping the pigs and being jealous of what they're eating. Do you remember that? And, and that is the lowest of low points for someone of the Jewish faith because pigs are unclean and it suddenly realizes them I can it suddenly dawns on them I can come home uh, there's Jonah in the Old Testament <clears throat> Jonah's called to be a faithful prophet Jonah go do what I tell you to do and Jonah says I think I know better for my life so when he's told to go east he goes west 
and he ends up being swallowed by a great fish, right? And an interesting scene in Jonah, this prophet, this unfaithful prophet, is, is that you see him in the belly of the great fish, and he calls out to God. Well, who doesn't call out to God in the belly of a great fish? Right? There are no atheists in, in bellies of big fish. And I think I'm just reminded that sometimes the air has to smell pretty bad before we decide that home isn't so bad after all. And, and I think that God is not above using fish guts and pig slop to make our hearts hungry for goodness. And, and he allows us to experience the pain and the difficulty of the Babylonians and the Assyrians because of our unfaithfulness. But what I love about that is that even though it's not necessary, God redeems it for something good. Let me explain that. In exile, God renews this people's sense of identity. Did you know that after the exile, you never again read about well, you can't see that yet. <laughs> Do you see it? Say no. <laughs> you don't? Oh, really? It's free. You just get to write it down. This is all, this is all free. It's extra material. Some things don't always make the process of building the overheads. <laughs> In exile, God renews this people's sense of identity. Did you know that after the exile, never again do you hear God indicting his people about foreign idol worship? Did you know that? <laughs> it's back. And I think that's amazing. Because in their easy times, they're guilty of idolatry and turning to foreign gods for their, for their security. And they're guilty of oppressing people who they think are below them. And these things disappear after this experience of exile. It's, 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 it's almost as if they're incredibly humbled. But, but I also know this. They realize that they are still God's people without, they have to, without the land, without a king, and without a temple. It's interesting. Those who are a faithful remnant, who still care about the calling of God, and 50,000 of them go, you read about some that stay behind, and you read about Ruth and Esther. 50,000 of them go, and at the king's invitation, Cyrus' invitation, they go and they rebuild the temple, and of course, Nehemiah will be one of them. And they go because their heart still cares about what happens to the sacred things of God. They're going to have to figure out that they are still God's people without the land, without a king, without a temple. If you ask me, the way I see this is that the exile is a setup for preparing their hearts. I say that because in all three of these instances, you'll see it in Sunday school if you come to Sunday school. I'm teaching Sunday school at 11 o'clock if you'd like to come. <laughs> in all three of those instances, there's an anticlimactic ending for every one of them. In, in this particular one, they build the temple all right. You know that it's going to get done. As you read through that, you'll find that out. They build the second temple. The second temple is the temple that's standing when Jesus shows up on the scene 350 years later. It's destroyed 70 years after, um, after the birth of Christ. So, so that, that's the second temple. They're going to get it done. And they actually sing the same songs that they sang earlier when Solomon dedicated the temple. But you'll notice a key difference between what happens in Solomon's day and in Ezra's day, Zerubbabel's day. The big difference is this. In Solomon's day, when they dedicate the first temple, the glory of the Lord shows up and fills the temple. But in the second temple, there is no indication that the glory of the Lord shows up. Even though they sing the same songs, they recovered the same foundation, they built on the same foundation, in fact, it says that the young people rejoiced and they were happy and ecstatic, but the older people wept. We don't know exactly why that is. Maybe they remembered exactly how splendorous Solomon's temple really was. I don't know. And they were compared. We don't know why they wept. 
But there's this, this real feeling of, is that all? We expected something greater. And what I see happening is I see God preparing them for what will become the true temple, which you know is what? It's the church. It's people. It's not the building. God can bring new life through loss. You know, God spoke to people in many, many ways, spectacular ways, actually. God once spoke through a burning bush. God spoke one time through a cloud and spoke through a pillar of fire. He once spoke to Balaam through a donkey. It's no wonder God can speak through Cyrus, right? And, and if you get something great out of this sermon, you may have heard through a pastor. And don't be shocked. And I don't want to hear the comparison to Balaam. <laughs> and God speaks maybe unexpectedly through our pain. Even unnecessary pain. Pain that, that was avoidable pain. God doesn't waste it. Somehow in his sovereignty, God is able to meet us in our pain and teach us and change us through our pain. I've given you two encouragements. God has the final say. He's in control. We know that by faith. God brings new life from loss. And I want to leave you today with a third thing. And, and really, it's a picture. I want to read this from Ezra 3. Despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Both the morning and the evening sacrifice. How excited they must have been to do that because they haven't been able to do that all those years. Then in accordance with what's written, they celebrated the Festival of Tabernacles. What I see in this picture is a challenge, and the challenge is this. We, as people of faith, give thanks in dark times. Picture this. The first thing these people do is they worship and they celebrate, even though the temple is not built up yet. Can you do that? Do I have the grace to do that with faith? They find the old foundation, the altar. They rebuild the altar. Verse 3 continues. They, they build on that foundation. And they sacrifice burnt offerings on it. This is their way of repenting. Wash us with the blood. Sacrifice at the altar is, is how we understand the cross of Jesus. This is their symbol of their desire to be right with God. And then in verse 4, they go further than that. They celebrate the festival of tabernacles. They celebrate. It's a big party. And I want you to see that that is a discipline. It is a discipline to celebrate in the midst of destruction. To be willing to rejoice in the rubble. They do not wait until the temple is completed before you see their joy, before you see their sacrifice of worship. You see their faithfulness before it's done. They don't wait until the temple work is completed. Even though there are foreigners who have taken their place and are not happy to see them, verse 3, in spite of their fear of those people, they are able to celebrate. If you and I wait until life is perfect before we worship like this, we will never worship like this. <laughs> if you and I wait to do as Jesus says and treat other people the way that we want to be treated, for example, if, if we honor each other, if we love each other, if we just simply enjoy each other, if we don't do those things until the other person deserves it, until they've got things together, until they're perfect, it's never going to happen. You will never enjoy the people in your life if you are waiting for them to clean up their act. And, and I see these as investments in faith, of being willing to, to love, being willing to celebrate, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to be faithful, even though you see that what you really want is not there yet. Someone said that the only difference between faith and thanksgiving is timing. Saying thanks happens after you get something. In faith, we say thanks before we get something. 
and we say, God, whatever your will is, that's what I want. I know that you're good. I will worship you without this thing that I think will make my life complete. I want to invite us to spend a few minutes just silently reflecting and listening. How is God speaking to you? The Lord, of course, knows our individual needs today. He knows our hearts. And we trust that he would speak to us individually if we would still ourselves and simply be willing to listen.